May I encourage you to have a Bible open in front of you and follow along with our scripture reading this morning from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. And that can be found on page 1186 of the Bibles in the pews, 1186. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting at verse 1. Let us listen to God's word. You know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We had, a, we had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from men, nor from you or anyone else. As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Amen. As we join together in prayers of intercession, the, I'd just like to let you know that the last few words I speak are from a prayer written by Scotty Smith, who is an American pastor and teacher. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you for your good. You are our Redeemer, God and Saviour. You have made yourself known to us. You love us and have promised to be with us in every situation. And you have given us your word to guide us. Our Father, we thank you that in your mercy and grace, you have called us to be part of your worldwide family, committed to pray and care for one another. And so we pray for our brothers and sisters who struggle to find food or shelter, <clears throat> who are living in dangerous places, or who are in prison for their faith. We pray for all those who are suffering for their faith in you. We know that you see their trials and tears, and that you hold them securely as they trust in you. We pray you would give them strength and grace to stand firm. Thank you for their witness, for their example to us, and for the miracles you are working in their situations. We pray for organizations that bring help. Thank you that they are in a position to see what is needed and to supply it. We pray for Helen in Japan and Simone in Nepal, that they will walk closely with you and will know you're guiding in difficult situations and that the joy of the Lord will be their strength. We pray for Frank and Claire as they come towards the end of Frank's time as moderator. Thank you for all you have enabled them to do. Be with them, giving them the energy to finish the year well. And we ask that you will be with Noble McNeely as he prepares to take on this role in a few weeks' time. For Walkway Sundays this morning, may it be the start of a journey for children to come and to know and to love you. And the kids zone upstairs and the youth service tonight and all the activities that will take place here this week. May your name be lifted up and people pointed to Jesus. We bring to you now those people and situations that are on our hearts. Bless those who are feeling the sadness of loss. Be with those who are in hospital, those recovering from surgery, undergoing treatment or waiting for tests. Give patience and hope to those weary with the difficulties of their lives, those who are anxious about loved ones at home or far away, those who are worried about the demands of their jobs, 
those who are doing exams, and those who are celebrating new things. Holy Spirit, please give peace, comfort, healing, joy, and hope to us this morning. Heavenly Father, we live in an uncertain world where this week we have seen that attacks on computer systems and institutions are becoming more common. And we pray for all affected by the breakdown of the NHS computer systems in England and Scotland. We live in a world where terrorism is growing and seems to be unstoppable. A world of international tension and suspicion where more people are turning away from you and from justice and truth. Save us from despair. Help us to look to you, for you are sovereign and you are working your purposes out. And in you alone, we will find our help and hope. Lord Jesus, you invite all who labour and are heavy laden to come to you, and you will give us rest. Rest from the things that trouble us and destroy our peace. Rest from thinking you are disappointed in us. Rest from thinking we should be better by now. Rest from the condemning voice of the accuser. Rest from the false guilt of our failure. Rest from the real shame of our past. Rest from the uncertainties of our future. Lord, we thank you that where your people are, you are there. The great I am. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. we pray. Faithful and unchanging one, our rock, our hope, our strength. Open our minds and inform our hearts this morning that we might hear that word which brings peace, that can bring, bring rebuke, that brings encouragement and challenge, and be glorified through our response of dedication, faith, and love. In Jesus' name, amen. During the week, R Ruth missed uh, an, an episode of MasterChef, and she went off to watch it on the iPlayer, and that meant that I could watch a cowboy picture, one of Clint Eastwood's. And uh, as I watched it, uh, modern cowboys are different from the kind I was brought up on. I was brought up before television and watched a cowboy trailer every Saturday morning. And they were always the same. Always the same, with the same characters, the goody and the baddie and the girl who gave the love interest. And when you were eight and nine, how you hated love interest the way we eight and nine-year-olds did. And uh, the, the sheriff, and the, a character you don't see very much now in westerns was the quack, N not a duck, the, the, the snake oil salesman. You know the guy who drove into town, normally had a top hat, and he, sell, he sold this wonderful potion that cured dandruff, and athlete's foot, and absolutely everything in between. You remember the guy? And usually he was out for money and sometimes dissatisfied gullible purchasers were out for him and often he had to leave town fast. And I thought about him, yes, when I was thinking about cowboy pictures, but when I was thinking about this passage. Turn to it, please. 1 Thessalonians 2. Just to remind you again of the background. From Acts we learn Paul was in a dead end in Troy in modern Turkey, 
and he wanted to go one way and the other way and he couldn't succeed and then he had a vision from a man from Greece where he had never intended to go, Macedonia, saying, come over and help us. And so he, he crossed the narrow strip of water and went into Macedonia and he visited Philippi. He went, and then he went on to Thessalonica. And now he is writing uh, to the believers, his converts, those who were converted during his brief stay in Thessalonica. In modern maps, it's called Salonica. They've cut off the Thessal bit. And uh, this passage tells us that things were not going well with his new converts. They weren't going well. Some were trying to discredit Paul. His visit was of no value, they were saying. He had to leave town in the middle of the night, and he did, as we read in the book of Acts, snake oil salesman. And he was out using flattery and trickery to get his way with all of you. And Paul, one of the reasons why he writes this letter is to say, that isn't true. You know, brothers, brethren, uh, verse 1 of chapter 2, you know that our visit to you was not a failure. It wasn't of no account. That's what they were saying. We previously suffered and had been insulted in Philippi. Remember, they were thrown into jail, and then there was the earthquake, and then they were beaten. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. He is appealing to their experience of him, their memory of what went on in those days. You know, verse 1, uh, you know again in verse 2, as you know, Verse 5, as you know. Verse 9, surely you remember. Verse 11, for you know. He is appealing and asking them to remember what it had really been like. And not like uh, as this lot were, were making out. Criticizing him and trying to undermine the work he was doing. And in his concern to protect and strengthen these very young Christians, convert, converted, uh, well, a few had been converted out of Judaism, but most were from a Gentile background. So they hadn't a clue. They were starting from an absolutely zilch level. To help them, he, and who are beginning to waver under the onslaught from these critics, he gives perhaps the most detailed and um, intimate picture of his relationship to his converts, the pastor's relationship to his people. Now you say, ah, well, this, this passage will be very good for you, Bill, and for Damien, and for Elizabeth, and for Reuben, and for the other people who have pastoral responsibilities. Well, yes, and uh, this applies definitely to, let's call them professional pastors. But note this. We're all familiar with the phrase, the priesthood of all believers. But I want to give you another phrase that you should know. And what is it? The pastorhood of all believers. The pastorhood of all believers. It's not just ministers and church workers and elders who care 
pastorally for others. We all are called to care for one another, to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ to give just one verse, and I could give lots more. So this is a message for all of us. So nobody is going to sit back and think, yes, Lord, give it to the pastors. No, no, it's for us all. And in this passage, Paul uses, and I don't think he was a Presbyterian, although I think he was close, but uh, we do have uh, three pictures in this passage. Three pictures. Verses 1 to 6, the picture of the steward. And then we have uh, 6 to 9, the picture of the nursing mother. And then 10 to 12, the picture of the pastor as a father. First of all, as steward. Now, you won't find that word in the text, but I don't think I'm reading uh, because... He doesn't use that word. I'm not reading into the text. What was a steward? A steward was a servant who was given responsibility. Responsibility to look after part of the master's, his domain or his farm or uh, his business. And remember, Jesus told a number of parables about a master who gave talents to a servant and then went off to another country leaving them to get on with the job and they were rewarded or otherwise as they did that and what does he the master entrusted his steward with a job well what does Paul say verse 4 we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. A steward is entrusted with a job, and he said we were entrusted with the gospel approved by God. Paul saw this in his other writings as a real responsibility. And he says in 1 Corinthians, it is required that those who are given a trust, the same expression, be found faithful. Elsewhere he says, I am simply discharging the trust given to me, the, the, the trust to preach the gospel. And woe, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. He saw being entrusted with a task as being his responsibility. But he also saw it as a great privilege. He described himself as the least of all the apostles, but yet he was entrusted with the task of preaching to the Gentiles at his encounter with the risen Lord on the road to Damascus. And that was privilege. And when you count something a privilege, it makes a difference. There are a number of you here, my generation, grandparents, and I have the greatest respect for you because you look after grandchildren every week. I don't know how you do it. When my lot come along, I develop a tick but I keep saying to myself, Billy, it's a privilege, it's a privilege, it's a privilege. And that sees me through. And counting this task as a privilege affects our motivation. Our motivation. Uh, look at verse 4 again. We speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. And then he goes on. We are not trying to please men, but God. Not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. 
And so he, he says in verse 3, this appeal we make, the challenge to follow Christ, verse 3, does not spring from error or impure motives. His motivation is to please God, not to please anybody else. Sometimes it helps if other people are pleased, but the primary motivation is much higher than that. And if that is the motivation, then it affects the method. When you're looking for the praise from men, you behave in one way, but when you're seeking the praise of God to please him. Verse 2, it's not from error, impure motives, or trickery. That got me thinking about the snake oil salesman. It's not from trickery. The presentation of the gospel and the, the Christian life relating to other people must not have deceit or trickery, self-seeking, or seeking to praise other people. Elsewhere in this passage, he talks about no flattery. No flattery. You're not pleasing other people. Verse 5, there it is. We never used flattery, nor did we have a mask to cover greed. Why? Because he's a faithful steward aiming to please his master. That's a challenge for us all. Then verses 6 to 9, the second picture. He begins in 6, with, as apostles of Christ, he says. But that's not what he's focusing on. Verse 7. We were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. Gentle, caring. And the, the picture is of a, a nursing mother. In fact, the, the word refers to a wet nurse. A, a, a mother taking someone's child and feeding it at the breast. And it, so it... it, it, it it can also refer to a mother who is nursing an infant. Now, one of the most beautiful pictures is the picture of a mother just after childbirth. Now, her hair is a mess. She, if labor has been uh, difficult, will have been sweating and, you know, and yet, when she takes, she's handed her new baby and takes this child to her breast. She beams. I haven't seen too many of them, but isn't that so? Isn't that so? It's, to, to my mind, it's a, a woman is never more beautiful. Absolutely. And isn't that a wonderful picture that Paul paints of this intimacy, gentleness, uh, cuddling. Yeah, I, I didn't think I would ever find the Greek word for cuddle, but I find it here. The word caring is the word for originally meaning to, to give heat. And so it's a word you would use for giving a cuddle. Isn't it wonderful? And he says, that's how we were among you. Uh, sharing, and th this is hard, but sharing not only the gospel, but our own selves. Now, it's easy to share the gospel. Well, relatively easy. The gospel is shared uh, through literature, and that's great. The gospel is shared through the media, and that's great. And we're to use all men, by all means, we have to seek to save some. But the most effective way of sharing the gospel is when 
yes, we let people know about the Lord and his greatness and his love and seek to encourage them to follow him. But when we also are sharing ourselves, literally, a nursing mother does that, sharing herself, nourishing the newborn child. And metaphorically and figuratively, we must share, be prepared to share ourselves, give our time, give our help, give our encouragement, give of ourselves and everybody has something to give. It's a wonderful picture of pastoral care, but it's also a very humbling picture. Very humbling picture. And I want to commend so many in this congregation who share more than the gospel, who share the gospel by the way they live, by their conversation, but also share themselves by helping with meals for people who are ill and, can't, and need that kind of help, for giving encouragement for all kinds of ways. The mother, the, the wet nurse sharing. Why? Because of, he says, because of the love. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel, but our lives as well, verse 8, because you became so dear to us, beginning, we loved you so much. That's at the basis of it all. Of it all. And the last thing to note about the mother in, in, in this picture, verse 6, uh, where he says, oh, verse 7, as apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you. As an apostle, he had rights. But he deliberately set them aside. He could have, been, he could have sought financial support while he was working with them. But what does he say? We worked day and night preaching during the day and working during the night so that he would not be a burden. In Christian work, have we rights? I don't know. I, I, I'm nervous about all this talking about rights. I'm, I'm very happy to support other people if their rights are not being honored. But I'm very reluctant to pursue my own. And if we're all doing that, supporting one another, then things work well. But when we are out for our rights, well, I'm very uncomfortable. Okay, the steward, the mother, the nurse, and I, we have a nurse with us, and I just want to say to you, sister, you're doing a great job, and we are very encouraged when you come and help uh, the residents of the archers. We appreciate what you do. Third picture, verses uh, 10 to 12. The picture of the mother and the steward, and now the picture of the father. Yet yeah, the, the last picture, gentlemen, was that you had to find your feminine side. And you may have been a little bit uneasy about that. Well, no, no point in being uneasy. That side has to be exhibited. But now there's the masculine side. You know, verse 11, that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, 
who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And how did he do that? Verse 10, you are our witnesses and so is God of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. The role of the father in the times of Paul's writing was to be responsible for the moral education of his children. He was responsible. Nowadays, lots of dads think that church and praying with the kids and that kind of side of things, that's for the missus. Not a bit of it. Not a bit of it. It's also for us. And it's not just teaching them. It's teaching them by example how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. You are witnesses. So this was observable behavior. They could see it. Otherwise, why does he say you are witnesses? Behavior that is seen is important, as is behavior that is not seen. And our aim? To help and encourage our children to live lives worthy of God, to live in his way. We don't often succeed. We don't always succeed. And sometimes we bear heavy burdens when children don't follow us. Well, what do we do? Two things I always say to people who talk to me about this. One, we keep praying. And two, we keep loving. That's what we do. And when our children are young and throughout our lives, we seek to show an example, holy, righteous, and blameless. Boys, oh, Paul sets the bar high. But we have the Holy Spirit to help us. Set an example, being a responsible dad. And my conclusion how does this passage end? We, leave, we teach our children and ourselves seek to live lives worthy of God who calls us into his kingdom and glory. We'll look a bit more about that in, in later passages in this book. But God is calling us into his kingdom. We have a future, a glorious future. And we're preparing for that as stewards, as nursing mothers, as responsible fathers. That's all, we combine all those pictures to get the whole three-dimensional picture. And also, encouraging one another to follow Jesus. Some of us have been doing that for years, decades. Some of us are still hovering, following Jesus, trusting in him who is the perfect example, the good shepherd of love, self-giving, and care for us all. Let's follow him. And let's pray. Lord, we are surprised at the boldness of Paul's expression, of the pictures he paints. They're startling. They are comforting. And they are challenging. Lord, as we move on in the service, 
let us not leave these behind, but help us to take them with us. And as you comfort and challenge, help us to respond ourselves to live lives worthy of you, our Savior. And as we seek to assist others to do the same, so hear us in Jesus' name. Amen.